Rogue Radio. Now available on Mixcloud at mixcloud.com forward slash rogue country. Keep it rogue. Hey guys, today we are sponsored by Rogue Country and Rogue Radio, which are available on mixcloud.com forward slash rogue country. I'm super fucking proud to be part of that initiative. It's artists promoting artists and showing the positive sides of country music, roots music, you know, dark folk, mad folk, alt country, honky tonk, bluegrass, you name it. If it's not in the mainstream, rogue country are pushing it. And for Rogue Radio, Rogue Country listeners and now into the van listeners, we have a little treat for you all as well. We've teamed up with Black Coffee Worship, a heavy black coffee company full of flavor, strength and power. Being massive fans of the heavier side of rock and roll, they draw their influences from metalheads, punk, rock, hardcore, black metal, thrash metal, all to produce a company with the same far beyond driven attitude. For Into the Van listeners and Rogue Radio listeners, if you go to Black Coffee Worship's website, which is blackcoffeeworship.co.uk and go to their store and use the code RC15, that's RC15, you'll get 15% off your order of coffee. They've got a load of different blends, a load of different beans, and it's a really great local company that I'm super proud to know and work with, and I really think you'll dig them. So head over to blackcoffeeworship.co.uk and use the promo code RC15. Can you hear that? Can you hear it? No, you can't. I've got a new chair. You know, after, uh, I think this is the 20th episode, so finally 20 episodes in, I've got a brand new chair. I was still using my old chair when I talked to Harry, so you have to deal with some of the squeaking, but the squeaking is gone. I've got a brand new chair with lumbar support, it's cushioned, it's comfy, and I can't believe I ever had such a piece of shit chair to begin with. Um, Talking of Rogue Country before, Rogue Country is how I found Harry Padigo. I'm lucky enough that I get to work with Rogue Country listen to artists, get to the inbox and see who sent stuff in. Harry was one of those people who sent stuff in with his EP, Dylan is Dead. With a name like that, I was interested. Looking at the artwork, it was reminiscent of, you know, black metal imagery that I'm, you know, a huge fan of black metal and thrash metal and power metal and all that type of stuff. So Harry's artwork immediately grabbed me and then I listened to his music and holy shit, you need to listen to Dylan is Dead. Harry Padigo has brought out an EP that fuses extreme music and black metal with traditional country and acoustic music, and it's just phenomenal. I know, as like my own like artist and artistic voice, I love it to be heavy. That's why I say on t-shirts, it's too heavy. This is heavier. This is more extreme. It's faster. It's in your face. The vocals are more metal. And if you like my stuff, if you like black metal, and if you're a fan of traditional country music, Harry Padigo's got you covered. Dylan is Dead is a phenomenal EP. If you think it's too heavy for you, which, you know, it may be for some, you can head over to his band camp. As well as Dylan is Dead, he also has a collected volume of folk songs, which include, you know, fiddle tunes, old standards, along with some originals that show his lighter side. And he's a phenomenal artist, and I'm so happy that I got to discover him through the Rogue Country inbox, and I just wanted to talk to him as soon as I could I don't think it's when we hit record but before we hit record I was explaining to Harry when I first set up into the van I wanted it to be you know face-to-face interactions I wanted to actually talk to artists and meet people and obviously COVID's put an end to that so I had to adapt and I didn't really want to do any interviews with people I hadn't met previously but you know that would have meant I hadn't had Rob Henry on would have meant I hadn't had Amelia Quinn or Ben Kaplan on. It means I wouldn't have had Bella White and definitely Harry Padigo. So I'm glad, you know, I like laxed my own rules to make a better podcast. And we hit over a thousand downloads. So I'm fucking stoked about that as well. Thank you all to everyone who's been listening. As we've hit a thousand downloads, I want to do something for you guys. If you would like a free digital download of The Next Life, all you need to do is direct message me on Instagram at Mike333West, at Twitter, which is Mike333West, or Facebook, which is MikeWest333, just to make a bit of a change of pace. If you hit me up on any of those platforms, I will send you a digital download for The Next Life, and I'm going to drop in a teaser here. I 
I'd gone and say a father to son and let this worldly view grow. Do what you can and love what you do, for it's a long and lonely road. It's a long and lonely road. It's a long and lonely road. Again, I'm super proud of this record. I want to get it to as many ears as possible. And as we've had over a thousand listens of Into the Van, I really want to share it with you guys. I've only heard from a couple of people who have listened to this podcast. So if you have listened, please drop me a comment, drop me a line, just so I know that you're out there because, you know, this isn't live music. This is me talking into the void and hoping people get back to me. The response I've had has been incredible, but, you know, my ego needs more and I want to make sure that you guys are enjoying it and you guys are you know listening to it and if you have thoughts about it you know I've changed the chair now so if you have other thoughts let me know because this is a podcast that I want to grow with you so please you know email me at mike333west at outlook.com there's tons of different ways to get in touch and I really want to hear from you but without further ado let's get into Harry Padigo's podcast because he was such a pleasure to talk to you know, he was super friendly, super outgoing, super warm. The conversation just flowed. And I'm so happy that I got to have this conversation with a man who's just bringing out some incredible music that I think changes the game and changes the perspective of what heavy country music or heavy alternative country music can be. Because we've got folks like Sean James and Amigo the Devil, Dylan Walsh, possessed by Paul James. I'll throw myself in there, you know, as a inspired by these people and it's awesome to see someone else flying that heavy flag for the acoustic genres so without further ado this is episode 20 of into the van with mike west and harry padigo welcome to into the van with me mike west okay so we're rolling now and thank you so much for joining us i believe it was your birthday on saturday that's right, Mike. It was my 28th birthday, so I can no longer um, join the 27 Club, but maybe that's for the better. But thank yeah, you, man. Aw- yeah, awesome, man. I was uh, 30 on Saturday as well, so we shared the same birthday, which I You're realized. kidding me, November. Oh, my good. Well, happy birthday to you, too, Mike. Thanks that's so wonderful, much. man. Yeah, but it's weird that you brought up the 27 Club because that was my first thought when I hit 28. And I don't know if you, as a musician, obviously, like Hendrix, Bain, Winehouse, Robert Johnson, like everyone's in the 27 Club. And when I pass them and turn 28, and now I'm 30 and I'm still thinking about it, you realize how fucking young they were. Oh, it's incredible, man. It's crazy. Those guys were just, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing the amount that they accomplished mm. during their lifetimes, for sure. It definitely is a wake-up call to, I need to get my ass in gear or something, you know? Because, yeah. like, when I was, I think I discovered Hendrix when I was, like, 15, 16. I remember I discovered, like, Nirvana and Kirk Cobain younger than that. And when you're a teenager, you hear 27, and you're like, that's an, an adult, <laughs> that's an old person. And yeah. looking back, and it's like, it's like it makes it so much more like tragic and then you realize how much they actually did accomplish in that small amount of time and it's just a really weird perspective it's even like like amy winehouse and stuff where it's yeah 27's fuck all at a time to go yeah it's crazy man you think about 27 it feels just like yesterday i was you know 21 and you know it, it's it's young man it's young it's crazy to see those people leave and the legacy they leave as well too yeah. is wild man yeah, but I was just like, I, I have existential crisis on the best of days. <laughs> but I was even thinking like, obviously I'm 30 now. And my dad was 25 when he had me. And he was like 22 <laughs> when he had my sister. So by the time he was 30, he already had like a five-year-old and an eight-year-old. And I've got like oh, man, right. two cats and an album out. And that's kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> exactly man i had the same thing happened i went into work today I, I teach at a small school here in um in ohio and the, the older teacher there she said happy birthday and she said you know how old are you and i told her 28 and she said by that time i had i had two kids and i was like holy shit that's just <laughs> it's wild man <laughs> it's weird i don't know if there's like the generations are just kind of i don't know why it seems to be like not necessarily slowing down or being more immature 
but it definitely seems like I wouldn't be in the same headspace as my dad was when he was 30. And this seems to be like a generational thing of people, like not necessarily easing off the gas, but just taking different routes. Yeah, I think you're right. It does seem like it's been, I think the same thing about my dad. He was born in 53 and you know, it's, um, it's definitely weird thinking about what he was doing at my age and what I'm doing now. And you're right. It seems like people are definitely exploring different things and, you know, pursuit of, you know, you know, I don't know, taking their time on their mm. artistic pursuits. And it's, it's interesting time to be alive, man, for sure. Yeah. I read a book a while ago and they were talking about these like little white foxes that they've been breathing in the Antarctic. And like, as the generations passed, they went from like feral to like the 10th generation was like a puppy. Like it was like completely tame and stuff. And I wonder if that's kind of like, wow, are we kind of getting bred into not like immaturity again, but it's like that kind of like society's kind of shaped us to be not necessarily the prototype that like our dads and granddads were. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy, man. You know, I was, um, you know, at school, I've been working with the kids. We've been reading, um, uh, Ray Bradbury's, um, Fahrenheit 451 and just thinking about how, you know, over the years with the emergence of new technologies and new ideas, and it, it's, it's kind of scary to see how that does shape the way you live. Mm. You know, I just noticed, I'm not sure, you know, if you see this where you guys live, but um, here in, in Ohio, when, when you go to uh, pump gasoline in your car, they have like little TV screens that'll turn on once you, they're on the pump and they'll turn on when you're pumping mm. your gasoline. Really, and it's just like, yeah, man, it's like, it, it's frightening because there's you're just bombarded with, um, with sort of, uh, you know, superficial um, entertainment, you know, mm -hmm. pop and all this stuff that just it's meant to sort of keep you, um, from from doing what you're supposed to do. It's very weird for sure, man. Yeah, I always like I worked in a supermarket for six years when I was like 16. It was my first job, and like again, just because I have like this weird existential crisis brain where i have a freak out every fucking five seconds i was working in this shop and it had like every choice imaginable of food but it was all the same food so it was like you had like 20 options of the same thing and then i was like this is just an illusion of choice to make you, mm -hmm. think you have like a control or a decision on stuff and the way the odds and like the cards are stacked now it's just a really you don't really have a choice in what's going to happen or what kind of food you want, no. <laughs> like outside of growing it yourself and going completely off the grid. It's really weird. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's bizarre, Mike. And, you know, not to make a, a silly comparison, but, you know, um, you know, what you guys, you know, do with your various podcasts in Rogue Country is a perfect example where, you know, you know, there's not a whole lot of element of choice in, mm -hmm. in what we choose to consume musically. And it's like, yeah. man, it's the same damn thing. It's crazy. Yeah, that's the thing. And I think coming to like music and stuff, it is if you take those 20 options at the supermarket, and you take what's on the radio, you do have this kind yeah. of jaded vision of what the world is and what music and what <laughs> art is. Because if you only pay attention to the top 50, even if you pay attention to like the top country artists on like the billboard right. or whatever's been nominated or whatever is seen by the establishment as what country music is or what even like any genre mm. is, you go, there's so much more to that. And like, I try and convert people <laughs> on Twitter and stuff when they say they don't like country music. And I go, no, you don't like the country music you've been shown. There's always a difference. Yeah. That. And I think, especially the stuff with rogue country, is it's just you try and make conscious decisions. But I think, like, you, you're a fan of black metal and stuff. Once I think you get into, like, metal, which is automatically outside the mainstream, you know to start right. looking for stuff. So to, you know, bring it back to yourself, this is a podcast where I'm having a conversation with you and I'm just being like, is the world against us? Um, <laughs> what is like your origins? What's your background before like coming to music and then coming into music? Oh yeah, man. It's, um, it's been interesting. You know, I, I've played music um, since I was a little kid. I, I started playing violin when I was eight years old and I got a little bit, you know, kind of disenchanted with classical music, not because I, didn't like it, but I was, you know, just kind of um, terrible at um, <laughs> practicing and mm -hmm. keeping up with what I needed to do. And so I, I got into old time, you know, Appalachian, you know, um, Kentucky bluegrass and old time fiddle and Irish and, you know, um, Irish fiddle and all that kind of stuff. And 
um, you know, just really, it really resonated with me, you know, that, that the tradition of, you know, you know, passing songs on by ear mm -hmm. and um, learning them that way. And that was something that really formed, you know, the way I looked at music, that, that kind of word of mouth, sharing things through a, an organic way, mm -hmm. like you were talking about at the beginning of the podcast, you know, like introductions made in an authentic way. And um, that kind of, I think that that perhaps may be informed just how I, you know, started to approach finding new music was mm -hmm. I wanted to find people who would sell me on it, people whose opinions I trusted and not, you know, something that, I, you know, from somebody I didn't know about or care about, you know. Mm. And like with, so with the classical thing, I always think, and it's the same thing I've been to like university and done like a music degree and stuff. And the second someone says, you have to learn this. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. fuck off in every way, shape, or form. Yeah. Like the second exactly. someone turns it into like a task instead of fun, which is what music is. <laughs> it's like the second someone takes the fun out of it, I instantly drop it. And I'm so stubborn. Like I'd ban my guitars to like stop them, <laughs> stop anyone from trying to teach me something I didn't want to do. But like with the classical and stuff, how did you come into the old time, like the Appalachian stuff? Was that through like family members and things? Yeah, but you know, my, my dad, um, he plays um, banjo and guitar and he's, a, he's an accomplished bluegrass musician and um, he would oftentimes, you know, play the Grand Old Opry around the house as mm. kids or we would listen to Lester and Earl, we listen to, you know, um, the Carter family, listen to a little bit. My favorite probably would be, um, you know, Ralph Stanley, love listening to Ralph Stanley as a kid and he introduced me to a... Um, a fiddle player out of Moorhead, Kentucky, which is south of where I live in, in Brown County, Ohio. And his name um, is Leo Blair. And he kind of, um, he kind of adopted me as a student after I transitioned away from classical. I think the, the, the area that I live in, you know, um, it's, it's very much, uh, it, it's kind of the, you know, the, the foothills of Appalachia and that music's big around this area. And I just was lucky to, to find Leo, who's just, he, he was a phenomenal fiddle teacher and dad kind of coaxed me on. And Leo really, like you were talking about, he made it fun and he mm. kind of, um, he was one of those teachers, you know, it's weird with education, like you were saying with, with learning new things, I kind of like to understand why I'm learning something yeah. or the, you know, the meaning behind it. And Leo was very good at explaining the history of things. And when it came to techniques with old time fiddle, he would explain why you would learn that technique and how it applied to a song. And he really kind of, um, yeah, Dr. Leo Blair was really, really a, a instrumental person in my music for sure. Cool. Man. And what was like the mindset going from classical to more like traditional, like folk style fiddle? Is there a, Obviously, in terms of like the notation and like mm. the feel, it's different. Like it's different. But what's like? Do you think of like the core differences between those two types of like playing? Oh, man, I gosh, I, one of the things that I learned, the first thing that comes to mind, Mike, is you know, um, and I, I like I said, I love listening and playing classical music, but you know, it's very uh, formulaic. Uh, that's too harsh of a word, but you know, there's a certain you stick to the music. Yeah to a certain degree. And one of the things I just loved about old time music was, you know, they encourage improvisation. They encourage your own renditions of songs. And, you know, I, I listened to a, collect a collection of fiddle recordings growing up and um, it was neat. This, this guy who did this collection had identified um, various areas in Kentucky that played, you know, the same song, but a different rendition of the song. So, you know, you would go, you know, I guess before the era of, you know, radio and, um, you know, vinyl and whatever, you know, you would hear, hear a song and, you know, that would travel 20 miles away and they would teach it. And that, that tradition of, you know, uniqueness and mm -hmm. authenticity and improv based on improvisation, that's really, you know, one of the core differences. And one of the, the things that really appealed to me was that improvisation and you making it your own in a way. Yeah. That's really interesting. Man. I think that's one of the things about classical and kind of pop music that they have these structures where, you know, it needs to be this structure for it to be this type of piece. And that's really interesting. Obviously, if you're writing in that style, because I've written for like string quartets and shit, when you're writing for that style, yeah. it makes sense to write in that style. But then when you're a musician <laughs> and you kind of realize that you can do whatever the fuck you want, like Black, <laughs> yeah, Sab yeah. Black Sabbath was a big one for me to do that because they didn't really stick to the verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle eight. They do like yeah, verse, 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 and then whatever the fuck was the end of the song. <laughs> 
and I try and put that into my songs. It's a really interesting way to try and fuck with structure. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's badass. I love that. You're, you're totally right with, you know, bringing up Sabbath. You know, there's uh, in, in like old time fiddle music. I really like these um, like modal songs where, you know, it's kind of right in that in between major minor kind of somewhere in the mm -hmm. middle. And that kind of reminds me of that 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 um, that Sabbath kind of vibe where you're like, man, I don't know what the hell is going on here chord wise, but I feel spooked the fuck out, dude. <laughs> Yeah. I'm with like going from traditional stuff before that what was like as a classical student what like composers or what like pieces stood out to you back then because I really loved him um, Schubert stuff like his piano mm, um, oh yeah man pieces like him um, Elkenig and stuff like I really love those like I think that's like the first metal song in my opinion that like like I really love that type of stuff and like Beethoven's things but what was like pieces do you, do you still listen to classical today Oh, I, I listened to a bit of classical, you know, um, I remember as a kid when we were, when I was studying classical, I was a young guy. I was probably, you know, probably from eight to eight to 12 or something. And our teacher was just a, he was, he was obsessed with Bach. We would, we went through all of Bach's minuets. And I remember just, um, you know, <laughs> it was kind of tough to get your head in the right space as a kid to listen to that but then you know like you said going back and listening to it now you're like holy shit that was Bach was Eddie Van Halen back in the day yeah. man holy shit I think that's one of the things that I think when I was studying it one of the things that like the classical teachers always fail to do is put it into a perspective that engaged with you where it was like if like the thing that I always loved about Beethoven stuff was his um oh, what the fuck's it called where it's a it's tribute to a great man what he wrote for Napoleon uh -huh. He changed the title because of how Napoleon betrayed France. It was like, <laughs> yeah, it was meant dude. to be in his honor, but then it was in his memory because he was dead to him, according to Beethoven. And that <laughs> type of thing is where you need to know that type of stuff before you even listen to these pieces of music. <laughs> There's such like a rich history to this that I think is missed out. And a lot of people hear this kind of arty, like high class music, but they yeah. don't realize how rooted in history it is. Dude, you're so spot on. That's such a neat point. You know, thinking about the context really shapes the way that you appreciate or, you know, listen to or view something. I man, that's kind of the that's kind of the truth, even in, you know, modern music. Mm -hmm. You think about the pop country stuff, you know, that we hear on the radio here in the States. It's like, man, you have a lot of people who um who, who try to replicate a form without um having the same context. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's like they don't you know, in order for 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 um, Beethoven to write, you know, the first you know diss track um, at Napoleon, you know, you have to have that on um, that context to be in that environment, that that, that that political situation. And the same thing's true with you know the music going on today. People try to, in my mind at least, you know, replicate without context. Mm. Yeah, definitely, man. I've just remembered it was the Eroica by Beethoven, the one he was thinking. But so your like, what were your first bands and stuff? Was it traditional mm. like bluegrass bands and stuff? What where were the first ones you started performing? Yeah. And where are you playing fiddle mainly for the most part? Because I know you play guitar as well. Yeah, I started fiddle fiddle mainly, um, and it was um, you know a couple bluegrass bands locally. I, I played a lot with my father once mm. I kind of started getting better at old time music. But I played in, you know, played fiddle kind of um, you know in these bluegrass bands. You might have five or six members, and kind of always had that um, you know backseat kind of backup player kind of thing i like that and that's cool and you know it really kind of cut my teeth on some of the classic bluegrass stuff but later started getting into you know playing in some duos and trios kind of honing down mm. the number of people in the band to kind of get to where you could actually bounce ideas off each other and was that like when you started right like becoming a songwriter and starting to write your own stuff as well you know i i don't think mike i don't think i started writing my own stuff until i started playing guitar really and you know i don't th i don't think i did a whole lot of stuff with vi maybe tried to to write a couple fiddle songs and then forgot them as soon as i you know deleted mm. the recording from my phone or whatever but I, when i started playing guitar that's when it kind of opened up a new sort of a, a new door to mm. you know possibilities of creating and that was i mean the guitar was really a um that was really a magical experience because I, I, I was self-taught 
And I didn't, I never had any instruction and learned it all, you know, either watching videos or watching people play. And I think because I approached it that way, it seemed like from the get go, it was all about um, like, like you were talking about doing whatever the fuck you want. Mm -hmm. And it's all about, you know, creativity. And that's when, that's why I started writing some songs, I think. Cool, man. And was that when like the metal influences started coming on? So you grew up on like classical for education stuff. Then it was the old timey stuff. When did you really start becoming aware of like rock and metal? Because I think, like I was saying yeah. before, when you pick up rock and metal as like a young person, that's when like <laughs> your personality really starts to be like identifying as this is me. Yeah, yeah, dude. I tell you what, I I picked up on you know the the rock and metal. Uh, the rock and metal scene, like in, in college. And I remember you might remember this too, but do you remember you used to be able to get on the internet and they had, um, I forget what it was called. It was like, it was lime wire or something. Oh, yeah. And you could find, <laughs> you'd find the most obscure, obscure stuff on there. And I remember the first band that I really, really liked and was really inspired by it for, as a, from a rock and roll perspective. And this is actually, this is kind of in your neck of the woods, but Fields of the Nephilim. I just thought yeah. my sister and I were big time into, that was our first real, you know, um, bite into the apple was, was goth, goth rock. We loved that. Mm. We loved Fields of the Nephilim and Rubicon, all that stuff. That was the slide guitars <laughs> in Fields of the Nephilim. I love that stuff a lot, man. And then from there, just go down the rabbit hole and, you know, you find yourself listening to, uh, Norwegian black metal and yeah. you know exploring that community for sure <laughs> yeah man I remember and obviously let's preface this by saying we know piracy is wrong that's right absolutely <laughs> yes but when, you're do that. but when you're 13 you really don't give a shit because you don't understand no. <laughs> what legal things are and what ownership is because I remember exactly. when I was a kid like what I used to do in high school when I was like 13 14 was I'd go onto Wikipedia and I'd get the metal page up and then it'd have the off branches of each like genre of metal. Yes. And I'd go onto each genre of metal and then pick like the first five bands that are named on that <laughs> Wikipedia page. I then go onto LimeWire. And sometimes like you'd only get half a song because whoever was seeding it would stop it. <laughs> so you'd have like the last minute, you just didn't know how it ended. And I remember exactly, man. that was like a really interesting and fun time because when you start discovering a music that's not like because my, my dad's into punk and like Kiss and Van Halen and stuff, but he wasn't into like the heavier stuff. He wasn't into like black metal and death metal. So when you start finding that type of stuff, that's like even extreme for your parents. That's when yeah. you're like, oh shit, this is mine. <laughs> yeah. I, like I, even with some black metal, like my partner, Siobhan, she's a fucking encyclopedia of black and death metal. She's incredible for it all. I'm like, Abbott. Terracon and then like kind of moving away from all like mayhem behemoth and all that kind yeah. of stuff but with yours because dylan is dead like before we get into this i just want to say this is exactly why i'm like i love working with rogue country because you emailed or messaged the rogue country inbox which i monitor and i fucking the first track i was hooked from dylan is dead man it's so <laughs> fucking cool but what was the kind of thought process or the songwriting ideas between trying to fuse that kind of extreme noise and vocal deliveries of black metal with the more traditional sound like country music. Mm. Uh, man, I tell you what, it kind of, it goes back to what we were talking about a second ago with, you know, learning guitar, like we were talking about, you know, black Sabbath. And I remember um, like, like you were saying, you going on Wikipedia and you're like 13 and you're like, holy shit, that guy got his fingers cut off in an accident. He plays <laughs> yeah. sort of playing drop tune. And you're like, yeah, I started playing because of those guys, you know, um, I started playing, I basically learned um, drop D and dad gad before I learned, you know, traditional chord shapes. Mm. And so transitioning from that and learning, you know, traditional chord shapes and getting into Bob Dylan and Neil Young, Roy Harper and those kind of guys. And, you know, I think from the get go, I had that, that drop D thing where just, mm. man, you put a guitar and drop D and holy shit, I just love, suddenly it's like, that's, that's what I want to play is drop <laughs> D. And then, and then from there, I, I don't know, I just, um, I got a little bit frustrated, you know, with some of the people, you know, in the local scene playing acoustic music and everybody kind of plays, you know, 
I don't know, like one, four, five or whatever, you know, it really traditional. I was like, man, it would be cool to just be cool to play something fast and heavy on an acoustic mm-hmm. guitar. Yeah. That's the thing I like about yourself. Cause some people, and I think, I don't know if it was like the MTV unplugged generation that kind of fucked it for everyone, but people <laughs> thought you could just take a rock song off an electric guitar and play on an acoustic guitar and be like, it's now an yes. acoustic song. And that kind of fucked what acoustic guitars could do in terms of being heavy yes. without having to be detuned or just trying to play like a, a metal riff on a guitar, like an acoustic guitar, which sounds shit. Right, man. No, you're totally right. It's weird. It seems like that is like a recipe for, you know, in often cases a recipe for disaster where you think that like, I'm just going to take a rock song and I'm going to play it on an acoustic. Maybe if you're Kurt Cobain, but you know, one of the things that I, I thought was kind of a neat idea was, you know, a lot of this, you know, the same thing with English ballads and, you know, this rich, rich history of murder ballads are both, both of our countries have is, you know, the traditional music is oftentimes you can find some dark, dark yeah. music. And if you kind of reverse the formula and say, well, I'm going to take an acoustic song and kind of metal it up, rather metal song and acoustic, mm. you know, turn it into acoustic. That seemed like it. That's one of the things I like to do. Find a song like um, like Pretty Polly or something like that and just play it really fucking, you know, <laughs> hardcore. Mm. Um, like with obviously you've been in duos and stuff and like, had you been gigging around as like duos and stuff for a while? And then when you started, when did you start playing like the songs from Dylan is Dead? When did you start playing them live? I kind of did. Like you said, I, I ran that circuit, you know, with it, with a lot of bar gigs, you know, for the past, you know, probably a solid four or five years, you know, my summers, you know, I teach, I teach school and we have the summers off in the U S and um, so I would just, I would play every weekend, you know, bar gigs. And then you kind of, you enjoy the money, but then you start getting a little bit, um, you know, a little dissatisfied or mm-hmm. jaded and so I, I kind of honed down further you know wanted to get really just um the parts that meant something started doing a couple solo solo gigs with a little bit of darker music and some of my own you know songs mm-hmm. mixed in that didn't happen until maybe maybe two years ago and you know dylan is dead came out this past um mm-hmm. this past summer and so i'd say for about a year and a half i've been kind of messing around with that that model of, of playing out live Cool, man. And what was the reaction like? Because obviously, like, I do the same thing. Like, my one of my taglines I have on the back of a t-shirt is it not country enough, not folk enough, not blues enough, too heavy, <laughs> which people have, like, told me before I put on a t-shirt, people were saying it was a criticism, but I was like, that's why I fucking play, so I don't give a shit. But, like, <laughs> when you're on a lineup or you're on a gig and people, like, you bring out the acoustic and people are expecting, you know, a certain sound, what's the reaction been like when you started dropping, like, When Shadows? Or where, what's it called? Where shadows forever fall? Yeah, oh man, that's yeah. a, that's a, I don't know. It's kind of, you know, it, it's been a little bit crazy, especially locally. You know, my, the, the guy who engineered the album, my good friend, Steven Strunk, who, who has a recording studio down here, you know, he told me I should, you know, you know, maybe think about releasing it under a different, different name or pseudonym just because mm. it might be too weird for people who are used to hearing Carter family covers and, you know, um, Earl Scruggs stuff, but it, it seems like it's sort of grown on people. It definitely seemed at first, Mike, it seemed like it was, you know, completely um, <laughs> no response at all locally. <laughs> and then, you know, people outside, you know, uh, Appalachian noise records and my friends from, you know, Pennsylvania, new friends from Oklahoma or outside of my, my group of, you know, you know, local, mm. you know, local scene or whatever. They seem like they kind of caught on first and then slowly it's been, you know, catching on. They're getting used to hearing a, a different kind of song, like for, for, for Shadows Forever Fall, for instance. Cool, man. And like with kind of the acceptance, it's really weird because it seems to always be like the outside of wherever you kind of focus on playing. It's always the periphery that like get onto <laughs> it first. But with kind of like the peripheral things, was there a clash of, you know, you said about a pseudonym, was there that hesitation to bring this out or perform them live initially? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was, um, it just such a, it was such a different, you know, thing for me to do, but you know, um, it seemed like there was, there was a grain, there's a grain of enough, um, folk and country Mm. to kind of, to kind of spin it. Like, you know, where, where shadows forever fall, you know, um, you could see, you know, if that wasn't, you know, um, without the growly vocals or whatever, it could, it could be just a, you know, folk song, you know, it's Mm. almost, 
it tries to ride that line where I think that that's what made it. So it was, you know, somewhat more easy to accept for people who are used to something else. Yeah. That was the thing, man. Like, I think it's sincere and that's what like loads of stuff comes down to. And it wasn't like someone trying to do like emperor songs on a fucking acoustic guitar. It <laughs> yeah, was dude. someone trying to fuse these genres that they love into something that like represented them but like you obviously have on Bandcamp you obviously have Dylan is Dead and you have the collected fiddle songs which do you think represents your perspective and your voice best I'd say it's gotta it gotta be Dylan is Dead man for the for the reasons you just said because it's that union of like it's it's that um I don't know it's like that you know, the, the image that we portray, you know, growing up and kind of the, the image that we want to produce, it's a, it's a union of the two things, you know, like our, our, our you know, our, our cultish sort of interest that we want to keep hidden. And then finally mm. you get to that moment where you can, oh, here's the way, here's the, 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 the formula to share it. And it, it feels good. It feels really good. And like you said, I, I think that those were, you know, all authentically written songs. I felt good about all of them. I really was happy that that finally got out. And I was really lucky, man, you know, that I was really flattered that Appalachian noise, you know, which is like a, balls to the wall fucking heavy black metal you know extreme metal you know um label they uh they, they did me a solid and, and did a run of those on limited cassette and that was really I, that felt like sort of a i don't know a welcome into the mm. you know acceptance into the scene like you're okay you're you're yeah. in it was so yes. good sigma do you know the uh, the devil's trade no dude the devil's trade yeah he's a hungarian musician and he's a folk artist and he plays like really heavy like he still uses an electric guitar and a banjo and stuff he's a solo musician he's on i think he's just been signed to what the fuck's that record label called uh, seasons of mist seasons of the mist oh yeah seasons just, of the mist man that's bad he's just brought out his folk album on seasons of the mist and he's been signed to like doom star uh, bookings <laughs> who like go to new york and he's a folk artist who plays this like heavy folk music if you don't know definitely go into a man like use i'll check it out use a tour perfectly together but like it's that kind of going back to what we talked about like pop country and you know mass produced music i think what your music does and what like the devil's trade does is it challenges people and their perceptions and when Mm. you start challenging people people always kind of go i didn't realize i needed this and (laughs) that's what i really think this type of heavy folk music is doing is it's fusing these genres that bring people together over just like a respect of sincere music and it's really interesting to kind of see how this trends kind of exploding with people like amigo the devil i was just about to mention amigo the devil and all these guys like you know even you know a a bigger name you know i guess you know nurgle's been doing this Mm. you know funky side project me and that man and i don't know it does seem like it seems like there's some kind of um there, there does seem to be a bit of a trend in this like heavy, dark folk where it seems like it's, um, it's catching on. And I, I, it probably is for the exact reasons, you know, you, you, you mentioned, you know, it's like this dissatisfaction. People are tired of, of, I think, of hearing sort of the Billboard top 20 country songs. And even I think that they get a little bit frustrated with you know the song structure kind of going back to our our conversation on classical music i remember i had a a teacher who was talking about you know what engages a listener with music and one of the things that's very um, interesting about classical music is you know our, our minds try to um, predict where the melody is going and classical music you know challenges you in a way because it's obviously very different than the sorts of melodies you would hear in in pop or country or rock or whatever and i think that these the, these models of uh, songwriting they might get a little bit tired after a while and i think that's happening with the with the folk and country thing because mm. man people have been playing the bob dylan you know model for a hell of a long time dude there's yeah. nothing wrong with it but damn it's been a while <laughs> well what was the reasoning behind the title dylan is dead oh man i tell you what i i, I always i love i love bob dylan a lot I, I really thank the world of bob and i just really enjoy i grew up on bob my uncle would play bob dylan and neil young all the time and i just um love their music and i love their passion and authenticity and you know in my mind dylan almost kind of uh, took on sort of like a mythological 
sort of place in music history in the same way Elvis, you know, the, the mm. king of rock and roll, same way Jimmy Page was like the wizard of guitar. And Bob Dylan to me was like that, um, that, that, ideal, that, that idea that you could be the singer, songwriter, solo artist and, you know, um, and, and, you know, have people listen and understand and share ideas. Just one man, one band with a guitar and it's it's odd because you know it seems like that sort of has become um almost impossible to attain with sort of the oversaturation mm. of people doing that i'm not sure if it was the mass production of guitars that that killed us mike but now everybody has an acoustic guitar and that's it, good but i think that it's sort of um it's it's killed the idea that or the the concept that dylan represented that this this vagabond songwriter this sort of um strolling minstrel this bard this one-man band who has you know a story to tell that's kind of i don't know it seems like that's sort of a uh, maybe something that's kind of um it, it's gone by us now it may be past that's really interesting man. i think like yeah you're right the acoustic guitar market is definitely oversaturated and i wonder how many people kind of buy one with the intention of landing one properly they get like two oasis songs in and go that's enough for a house party and then <laughs> leave it because there is like and i saw it with when ed sheeran came about when i was doing like open mic scenes yeah. and starting to come out when he was like at the peak there was so many people then who were bringing loop pedals and shit to open <laughs> mics and stuff. Yes. And it's a really weird thing because again, it's part of like the mainstream, like an acoustic guitar is easy to pick up, easy to play, but mm -hmm. it's hard to play with conviction, I think. And that's what a lot of, that's what Dylan, I think encapsulates. Like I'm not a huge Dylan fan. Like mm -hmm. I kind of have the, what is it? Like the, opinion maybe the wrong one or maybe the controversial opinion that like i like his songs and he's a phenomenal songwriter but i like other people doing his songs more <laughs> yeah man the the voice didn't help the poor guy i mean you're exactly right i, I see yeah for sure it's like you know um that like you mentioned with ed sheer and the same thing i feel like man i feel like it's happening today to an extent in in the states with um you know one of one of these up and coming and you know really accomplished musicians tyler childers mm. who's blowing up which i love tyler childers but man if you go to a jam anywhere in the state of ohio kentucky west virginia wherever it's everybody's trying to sound identical to that sound it's 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 weird it's very yeah, surprising. these artists kind of come along and because of how influential and game changing they are they change the game so much that it kind of fucks the genre for a while and it's really weird man and like my friend josh Bettis, who's a welsh country musician he said this thing and i shared it on facebook and he got a ton of shit for it because he said bob dylan is mumble rap for hippies <laughs> that's and, so accurate though <laughs> and like that's the thing it is dead accurate and it's fucking hilarious but like these type of artists i think definitely chilled us to an extent for like modern it'll be interesting to see like his longer legacy but like these people like come out of the quagmire of or stagnation of these acoustic artists and then everyone goes, <laughs> he did it. I'll be like that. Missing yeah. the point of he did it because he was using his own voice. And it's the Man, same thing with Dylan. That's brilliantly said, Mike. That's exactly it. They, they kind of, they, they see that he did something, he did something magical with music. You know, he, he accomplished something that's like, that's purely unique in a way. That's original. That's authentic. That's true. And then they, they mistake, like you said, they think that just replicating will do it when it's in fact that's not the 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 the, the end isn't the goal it's mm. the it's the path there which that's that's brilliantly said man well it's crazy man especially with like children's like i've seen him twice no and like i wasn't a fan of his not long violent history the album before that country square i wasn't really a fan of that and i saw him mm. as a solo artist in like a small club in Manchester first. And then I saw him at a sold out yeah. show with a full band. And it was weird how the vibe had completely changed. And it had gone from like, yes. it was a sold out show in the Manchester one, but it was like 60 people. And then it was a sold out yeah. show for the other one, but it was like 300 people. And it was weird mm. to see the crowd shift. Has that kind of been a thing, obviously as an American, as a country artist yourself, has that shift in crowd been noticeable in like where you are? when you gig 
Yeah, I think so, man. It, it's been very, you mentioned a great point with, with Tyler. I don't know. It just, it's, it's really odd when you see these guys in their, in the, in the blooming and the blossoming and they have that, you know, when they're playing those shows, you know, to sold out, you know, it's sold out, but it's only a few people and it just, it feels so pure and it feels so like um, authentic. And then you kind of get this, you know, um, America really struggles, man, with this sort of bar musician um, problem where you just get a lot of people who want to go to, uh, want to go to the show and drink and don't really, it's, it's not about the music. And I see that a lot with, you know, it's very hard to find a, an audience that is receptive, man, for sure. And with like your type of stuff, I assume when you start playing and you perform the vocals the way you do and you play the guitar the way you do, how much does that mean people kind of like stop what they're doing? Have you noticed that kind of shift between when you perform <laughs> as a duo and stuff and when you started doing this stuff? Yeah, I think that there's, you know, for people who aren't into into heavy metal or rock and roll, man, it's... um. You know, the vocals do, that, that gets them. I, I always loved um, listening to black metal vocals and just those guttural, just, you know, um, it really grabs your abrasive almost in a way, mm. but at the same time, melodic. And that's what makes it beautiful. And it does, it does turn some heads and maybe kind of turn some people, um, <laughs> maybe turn some people away as well. But I, I would almost rather have that than, you know, um, I would almost rather have, um, have that happen than, than people just, you know, backs to the stage drinking yeah. beer. I'd rather scare the shit out of them. Yeah, definitely, man. And it's with, so let's go into like Dylan is dead and stuff. How long had you been sitting on them songs mm -hmm. and how long had you been writing them songs before you started like going into the studio to record them? Yeah. Um, I'd see. I think, let me think. I, I know that where shadows forever fall. I, I wrote that one um, y years ago. I never wrote lyrics to it. And I always really, really liked that riff. And I, I think I wrote um, To Walk a Path Carved by Wolves. Mm. The, I wrote that intro, you know, five, six years ago, maybe even when I was in high school learning kind of how to play guitar. And then I don't know, I was, you know, here in where I live in the States, uh, I live in a very like isolated community, very small community. And I, I, I started renting a cabin um, you know, to stay in while I taught school and the cabin, Mike, it was really out. Um, it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere and you're living by myself mm -hmm. and didn't have Wi-Fi and didn't have um, heat. And so last winter about this time was when I said, you know, I'm going to get out the acoustic guitar. And then once you start, you know, I remember playing, I think that first riff, the intro, once you kind of get that in your, you know, you to put that in the, in the recipe, a lot of those other riffs just kind of um, started popping up. And I wrote that, you know, just over the, over the winter and then got into the studio in the spring and, you know, it was, it was, it was cut and dry, but yeah, some of those songs were old, especially where shadows forever fall in that intro riff. Mm, so for shadows, so you kind of wrote like the instrumental first and then the lyrics mm -hmm. later, what was your influence with the lyrics? Cause I know, Obviously, you kind of lend from country and folk, but the lyrics are very, you know, thematic and operatic in a way that's like <laughs> yeah. typical of like death metal and you know, like black metal and even like Dio and stuff. I got a vibe from it where it's very yeah, fantastical. Man. What was kind of your songwriting approach to those lyrics? Because I really love like what country is, is you kind of sing and what you're seeing. And sometimes you yeah. kind of, veil it in metaphor but not for the most part but this is mm. you know bigger in itself like thematically what was your process behind the lyrics well the, the lyrics always uh, you know it always is a struggle for me I, I really like writing you know riffs and chord progressions and Mike I just can't I, I can't do it very well and like you said like some of the observational country folk stuff and, and metaphoric stuff I like that I just can't it doesn't come naturally and so the way I would really I wrote a lot of those songs what I would like you said kind of thematically I would I would like to listen to them and play them over and over and I would say you know what does that sound like the soundtrack to what would that be in the if that was in a film what would that be and you know to walk a path carved by wolves is like that's when you're that's a fucking you know um attack of a rabid pack of you know wolves on mm -hmm. some unsuspecting villager and where shadows forever fall that was kind of um 
you know, like we talked about it a little bit earlier with um, Fields of the Nephilim. I always, you know, got into their mythos and, you know, the mm. fallen angels and, you know, apocalyptic sort of stuff. I felt like a, you know, kind of acoustic Marilyn Mancy, Man- Manson-y sort of, you know, mm. Um, you know, kind of kicking back like Nero while the while the angels fell from the sky, man. Cool, man. And like, who are really like your influences? I'm going to hit you with like fiddle or like violin influences, guitar and songwriting, like lyrics influences. Who do you consider like your top three of each? Oh, man. So uh, let's see. Um, lyrically, I love, I love, you know, like the black metal stuff and doom metal. I think that... Um, high on fire you know i love listening to high on fire man and just um the crazy sort of uh, occulty lovecraftian you know cosmic horror you know l- love listening to um eric danielson from from watain i think that is some pure pure dark black metal i love that so poetic too mm. and in an odd way too you know you think about um you know cradle of filth probably one of the danny filth has probably one of the most excellent grasps of you know um the english language and poetry i just mm. love that it's, it's so it's, it's so pure it's so brilliant i love that stuff man and you know violin i'm you know, grew up on Kenny Baker and, you know, John Hartford. Love songs about the river, playing those on the fiddle. And, you know, um, Bobby Hicks, all those classic bluegrass guys, especially John. John Hartford was mm-hmm. a, liked his style. He was kind of in between that polished and, you know, a little rough around the edges. That was brilliant. I'm trying to think, uh, guitar-wise, you know, um, gosh, I guess, you know, I guess Neil Young, and when Neil Young plugs into an amp on that, you know, busted ass, you know, Les Paul of his, but that's just a, that's a badass sound. Neil and, you know, Matt Pike, of course. And, you know, gosh, maybe, maybe even, you know, uh, you know, maybe even a little bit of Dylan, honestly. Mm. I like his. <laughs> cool, man. And like what you're saying about black metal and stuff, it is weird how poetic their stuff can be. Obviously like black metal has, this controversy and image around it that's obviously like cemented by Euronymous and mayhem and stuff. <laughs> but what that kind of takes away from, and obviously like the racism and the homophobia and all the bigotry mm-hmm. of black metal, it goes over and casts this huge shadow over what poetry is in like other black mm-hmm. metal bands who weren't representing them views. And it's mm-hmm. hard to differentiate that. And it's especially hard for like mainstream audiences to even try and fathom that there's poetry and <laughs> that type of stuff. And it's a really sad state of affairs. And obviously with, you know, even Cradle of Filth with their shock value. I remember Cradle of Filth, they were the second band I ever saw live. I saw Trivium in 2005 and then I saw Cradle of Filth a few months after. Oh man, that was a crazy show. But um, yeah, the dude. poetry behind those type of artists, like the songwriting in metal is really underrated, I think in terms of, what it actually is like the poetry and the imagery using it's just on another level that's not really represented in any other genre and that's what i really liked about your stuff was it was bringing that level to this acoustic stuff why mike thank you so much man it means a lot you know just to talk about this and you know um i appreciate that tremendously and you're right about you know Danny Filth, I mean, say what you want about Cradle of Filth, but you know, I remember listening to Absence with Faust as a kid and like, man, that is, that's, that's like, so that's, that could be out of a, a Shakespearean, you know, play or something. It's crazy. It really is. The, the beauty behind all the guttural growls is, um, is pretty, it's a pretty beautiful contrast. Mm. And like going just onto the controversy for a bit, have you seen the film Lords of Chaos, like the mayhem? Yeah, I did see that. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think of it? I, I don't know, man. I, I mean, I was, I was very excited when I heard it was coming out, but, you know, um, keeping up with, you know, some of these guys on, you know, in the black metal community, I know that that was, you know, of course, I'm not sure if you could do a, 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 you know, anything that would um, please the, the, the true culty black metal fans. And I, I get that, you know, I, I, you know, thematically, you know, maybe not quite, um, on point but you know fun movie to watch though yeah. I, I mean i enjoyed it i always you know eat up any sort of black metal nonsense they put out yeah man same it was fun to kind of like see obviously it's like the hollywoodized version <laughs> yeah. of it all and it's all streamlined and it's like macaulay Culkin's brother in it and stuff <laughs> yeah, but dude. like the thing i always took away from it and i always like, kind of laugh with my mates who are into it as well 
is it's like this is what happens if you don't admit you like the scorpions <laughs> exactly dude yeah no kidding <laughs> and it's all people trying to like out posture the other and it leads into this like catastrophic tale of events where it's just people aren't comfortable admitting what they actually like I know, dude, they kind of get to this level where it's like these guys sort of um, start to believe the myth of themselves that they created and then are offended by the truth. It's yeah. really, a, it's a very strange, um, it's, a, it's a fun, it's, it's definitely a fun community. I just, I crack up when you see the tweets from like, you'll see a thing on YouTube when your YouTube algorithm is as screwed up as mine. It'll be like, you know, Hellhammer speaks out about, you know, the Lords of Chaos. It, it's, it's, it's funny. I, I love the drama. That's kind of the part that makes it fun almost. Yeah, that's a- thing it's like all these kids were in like the forests of norway wearing makeup and writing poetry and you didn't expect drama to happen <laughs> yeah, you do you see fucking immortal in their first music video you don't expect that people are going to be talking about that shit later on it's like oh my goodness yeah. it's a riot man yeah, but like what type of like music are you listening to now is there anything like kind of contemporary that you're like jamming on that's influencing you or what you listen to at the moment you know, um, gosh, man, I've been listening to a whole bunch of um, a band called Glass Coffin mm. out, of, um, out of Kentucky. They're a, um, he's a black metal artist from the band, um, punk band Black Knife. And I've really, um, really been digging that. And uh, also there's an artist uh, out, of, out of the South here um, called Vide. Um, who I'm hoping will get signed to Seasons of the Mist here. He's had some really successful records come out through some of the local underground labels. And some of this local black metal stuff is just refreshing to kind of, I've been interested a little bit in, you know, um, trying to keep up, you know, better with some of the, you know, the United States black metal stuff, because I just feel, you know, after I got, you know, lucked out with getting onto Appalachian noise records, I just kind of, um, you know, it opened up a new door for, I, I didn't really listen a whole lot to United States black metal. Mm. I mean, before that, it was all, it's, it's Norwegian. It's, you know, you listen to Dissection and you listen to Mayhem and you have, you know, this kind of, um, which I love all those bands, but that's been neat. I've been really enjoying some of the United States black metal here recently. Cool, man. That's really interesting. I think the same way that people don't expect the UK to have country music, you don't expect other countries that are you know, famous for one type of thing. You don't expect it to be found anywhere else. But with Appalachian Noise, mm-hmm. how did that meeting come about and how did you get onto working with them? Dude, it was, it was crazy. You know, they, they said that they were going to do a compilation called, um, called True Appalachian Black Metal, which, um, you know, I'm not sure how much of that was a joke or what, but uh, they, they did not go through with that. But I did submit you know, in true, um, you know, black metal fashion, you know, a hand, you know, um, a hand numbered demo and, you know, a cryptic message, you know, that kind of stuff. And the guy, he was very, he he was really nice to me and, you know, said, you know, we'll give it a shot. We'll give you a, give you a shot. It was, it was definitely not anything like they had put out before, but just serendipity, man. It was just, I I submitted for that compilation and they they said, you can't do the compilation, but we'll, um, we, we'd like to do you, you know, for a limited run on here. So that was pretty cool. So man, all I'm thinking about is I'd love a fucking t-shirt that said true Appalachian black metal on it. (laughs) I know dude, that'd be fucking riot. (laughs) (laughs) So like with obviously Dylan is dead and things, what's kind of been, going forward from that like how have you been obviously covid's fucked gigs and stuff yeah, how yeah. have you been going forward with that record to try and get it out to people and get it you know into the right hands if you will i've been i've been trying to um you know it, it's it's tough to play that game you know on social media mm-hmm. and getting stuff yeah. out there i mean it's you gotta really fucking sell people on that and it's hit or miss you know i've had um had it out on a couple compilations through um through road rat records here in the mm. U S and you know, it's, it's weird, you know, keeping up with, you know, the, the stats on where people are, you know, listening to your music. It's like you said earlier, like, you know, people imagine that, you know, that the UK doesn't have a folk or country scene listening to rogue country. It's like, man, I think that you guys have a better grasp on country music than 99% of uh, Americans. And honestly, it seems like the UK has been, people have been listening to it a bit and, you know, uh, some people from, you know, um, from, from Russia have been into it. I sent a couple um, demos out to them, some kind of, um, 
special stuff for people who really were digging it. I got a buddy of mine, um, Mikkel, who, uh, who lives in, 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 in um, Sweden and he's, he's been into it. So I don't know. I, I haven't figured out how to, how to quite, you know, get it in the right hands. I guess I'll just keep on, you know, you know, sending it out there, man. But yeah. I've been happy with the people who have, you know, gotten into it. I've been really, that, that just, that's enough for me, man, for real. So man, what's kind of like your future plans? Obviously you've got the record and out. Oh. Are you writing a new one or what's kind of like yes. your vision for the future? Yes, I've got it, man. Mike, it's, you would appreciate this and, and sympathize as a musician, but I've got, I've got it completely. I've got it completely written. I'm doing, I've got an EP that is, you know, um, I think it's about, it's going to be about three to four songs and it's going to be, it, it's by far the work I'm most proud of. Mm. And it's a, it's a much, um, it's, it's more aggressive, it's grander, it's longer, it's heavier. And I just can't, um, you know, my, the engineer who I work with, um, he was exposed to COVID. And so we've been backed up, we tracked all the rhythm tracks and now we're just kind of in purgatory waiting mm. on everybody to, to, to heal up and get safe. So, you know, hopefully in the springtime, I want to the follow up is going to be um, in my, I hope it's going to be legendary. It's going to be badass. Awesome. Man. What's kind of been the songwriting process? Has it been similar to Dylan is dead where you've had the instrumental tracks first and then the lyrics come later? Yes, it, it has been partly, you know, the, the two tracks that are kind of the core of this next, um, next release, they're, um, they're, both, they're both much longer than any of the stuff on Dylan has did. The first track is, I think it was eight minutes when we tracked the, um, the, the rhythm to it. And it's, um, the lyrics came like that for that one. And it was a, it, it just felt, you know, when you have all the stars aligned, you're like, holy shit, that's, that's, a, that's a song I'm proud of. So, you know, it's been similar, but it seemed like, you know, a little bit more motivation, you know, instead of being motivated by, you know, being depressed in a cabin, mm. you know, with no heat. Um, <laughs> that was just like, man, that would be so fucking cool to get some, to, to one up this last release and really try to catch some people's attention. And also, you know, you know, people who dig it, I really want to give back to, to them and make sure that they have some, some new fun music to, to get into. That's awesome, man. Like, I think what, you do is really interesting and unique in like what you're like fusing and it's showing this again we were talking about before like this trend of heavier acoustic music that is true acoustic music it's not meant to be anything else other than what it is Ah. but have you seen that kind of trend picking up is there anyone kind of around your way that's doing something similar or was it kind of because for me like i was playing this kind of like heavier stuff where i wasn't like singing as a metal singer or anything, it was just kind of what I was doing. And it wasn't until I heard like Sean James's stuff Mm -hmm. where I was like, Oh shit, that's someone (laughs) else. Has there been anyone that's kind of clicked like that for you? And that's kind of motivated you all at least let you know that you aren't alone in this. You know, it has been, um, it's been cool because I, I, nobody in the, in the local scene and, you know, keep in mind, man, I mean, it's a very tiny, Mm. you know, I live kind of in the middle of nowhere, but you know, um, outside, you know, hooking up with people like you and more recently, you know, talking with um, some of these dark folk bands and, and dark country bands like, um, uh, you know, somebody like um, we think of who, you know, somebody like the, the, the trash bats out of, you know, Pennsylvania, those guys, they get it. And I can bond with them and identify with them over that kind of dark, heavy, mm. you know, um, you know, no fucks given acoustic music and there you're right you find these people when you find it man it feels good because you know you you get that too and you find somebody who is on the same wavelength it clicks yeah there's a really interesting like european scene of it like i did a festival last year called pick and bones and there's a band called like the heathen apostles who are like dark folk the devil's really? trade played it and there's a guy called uncle wormwood who was meant to be playing it this year who i'm friends with who's a finnish artist who builds like cigar box guitars and just beats the shit no out kidding. of them. And there's this really interesting dark routine. And I'm the same as you where the Liverpool scene is really insular and small and it's heavily influenced by Bob Dylan and obviously the Beatles. So mm-hmm. John Lennon's like God. <laughs> and it's that type of sound. And I know if I'd have stuck to where Liverpool is and just played that, I'd have been fucked. I would have given up years ago. Yeah. Well, I like was lucky enough to just start traveling for gigs because I know 
there was there's like a load of articles and kind of things when you're googling like should i tour or whatever and there's always like i've read things where you shouldn't tour outside of your home county or whatever if you want bringing in a crowd of 200 people to a show which if anyone brings a crowd of 200 people i'd be <laughs> fucking shocked i remember i saw 36 crazy fist in liverpool and like 50 people came out to it <laughs> right man exactly <laughs> so like i purposely went and tried to find different places in like the uk and europe that welcome that type of stuff like there's a black metal bar in the netherlands which would fucking eat you up and i've played there a couple Dude. of times and it's you have to go out of like your circles and when you find these type of people there is a really interesting european scene at the moment that would fucking love you that's fascinating to me man because it's crazy to think about you know um you know just how um, I, I don't know how how different in a, in a way that is because you know there's there's really not a whole lot you know locally, you know any remotely you know inspired by the same sort of things I draw from. Not that I'm doing anything fancy or anything, but it's it's it, it blows my mind to imagine you know um, you know going to a, a bar where that would be like that would be the fucking norm or something. That's just that's mm. that's crazy, man. I would love to I'd love to check out that scene. I wish I could get over to the UK, man. It'd be a brilliant it'd be a brilliant time. Yeah, I'll chuck you some um, emails on Messenger after this. But um, the black metal bar in Groningen in the Netherlands is called the White Wolf. And they have a shrine to Bachmet at the back of it that you play in front of. And it's so fucking cool. They're currently, obviously with COVID and everything, like venues and everything's fucked, but they're currently moving um, to a new venue. And I can't wait to get out there and play if Brexit doesn't fuck us. But (laughs) if if you try and find a scene or you try and like scratch the surface you definitely find something and it's weird to know that if you don't look you'll never see it Uh, and it's obviously it's coming kind of full circle to what we talked about before where it's like if you just pay attention to the mainstream mm -hmm. you're completely and utterly like in the dark but if you just kind of scratch the surface and pay attention to what's on the periphery you find amazing artists like yourself and you start trying to just like dig into a sound that might represent you better than anything in the mainstream can Mike, I tell you, what, I just, it's, um, you, you've said it so well, man. It's, this has been such a, you know, such a privilege and an honor to, to meet up with you guys and what you do at Rogue Country, man, and your music and, and what you do for other musicians. It's, it's pretty incredible, man. It's really just um, really an honor to, to talk with you, brother, for real. Thank you. I've been really hyped to, I've been listening to Dylan is Dead. Like, I'm not bullshitting. Like, I'm not in any position where I need to pander to people or like, have people on that I don't like or like so honestly I've been fucking listening to your record a ton it's so fun and um, we're hitting up to the hour mark so I'll let you go in a minute but obviously you've got the record coming out do you have an idea of how long that album is so you said like some tracks are eight minutes how yeah. like many tracks are going to be on this record I mean it's going to be I think it's going to be either um I think it's going to be three or four mm. and I want to I want to get it a bit longer then um, Dylan is dead because that was sort of, you know, some of those, you know, got that misfits kind of time, time frame where it's like fucking two minutes and we're out or whatever. But, um, but I, I want to, these longer tracks, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to really get into um, creating some kind of, you know, soundscapes that are, you know, contrast a little bit more radically with the different parts, you know, compared to Dylan is dead, some really heavy tremolo picked and then some really just um, fucking, you know, devil's triad sort of black Sabbath, mm-hmm. you know? So I'm hoping it'll be, you know, three, three, four tracks, 30 minute range. And, um, you know, got some pretty kick-ass um, album artwork in the, in the works for my friends um, in the band um, Stone Ram and uh, also their side project. I'm forced of Orthanc and they're doing some kick-ass um, some, artwork and i'm totally stoked on that man so I'm, i can't wait for you guys to hear it cool man and what's like the instrumentation on the new record is it similar to dylan is dead because i know that was like guitar fiddle drums mm. and vocals was there anything i'm missing on that or was it no you're spot on it was you know it was the idea with dylan is dead was to do do it exactly with, with some additions um in, in exactly in a way that it could be replicated with one person mm. live that was sort of the cool. idea and so that's sort of the dilemma i've run into a little bit with this this um follow-up because i rehearsed with a um with a drummer and a um and a bass player and really um you know 
it was really exciting because I love playing, you know, um, rock and metal together. And it, it sort of changed it in a way. And I'm not sure, I'm kind of on the fence right now, to be honest. I'm not sure if, you know, if I were to add too many additional things without just forming a new, a new band, if that would be, um, you know, sort of, mm. um, it, it would have follow up nicely with that idea that, you know, it's something that you could replicate by, I like that, uh, in, that independence of when yeah. you can say, I could do this shit by myself and it's exactly how it would sound if I were, you know, playing it live. Yeah. Cool, man. And is that the kind of same motto that you're having for the next album? Cause I know from my own stuff and it's kind of a compliment and it's kind of ugh, when people go, I'd love to see you with a band and it's yeah. like, I'd love to be able to pay for a fucking band. <laughs> I know, right. dude, I know. <laughs> Isn't that the truth, man? You get that as a, as a gigging musician playing out and stuff. You're like, man, you know, the, <laughs> the less people we have in this, the more money we're, we're all making. Yeah. And the same is true with, you know, the, the, I don't know, with this next album, I was thinking about that exact same thing today. Because it just, um, you know, I, I don't, I, you know, it's always good to add and to, you know, to build in such a way that you know makes it bigger and better but i don't want to leave behind that um the minimalism in mm. a sense of you know what makes that uh, able to be played as one person one individual yeah so i think it i think it should be something similar but you know maybe with if i can figure out a way to sort of authentically add more to it without making it something that's um you know like a you know a fucking album with you know Mm. 200 200 tracks on it or something like that you know yeah cool man i think that's the best thing to do because obviously i'm a solo artist and on the new record i've just brought i've got like bass pedal steel fiddle harmonica but i don't think they're missing when i'm playing live and stuff and i like to try and go this is live and this is what the record is and i know a lot of people think that once you've done the record you should try and play as close to that as possible live but then I think that can lead to not necessarily a stagnation, but it's, you need to make it yes. interesting. More importantly, I need to make it interesting for myself. You're right. And you said it so perfectly, Mike, where it's that idea where like, it's, it's, you, you have the album, which is like the masterpiece, the painting. And then the live show is going to be a copy of that, but in a different way. And like you said it perfectly, man, if you can find a way to make it so um, just playing it solo is not actually distracting or it's not um it, it's not lessening the mm-hmm. you know impact of the performance that's an interesting i i need to i'll be thinking about that for sure these next couple of months as we kind of get you know hopefully back into the studio how to how to how to do that in the right way it's yeah. it's it's crazy man you know I've, all this is my first experience really even um you know recording anything dylan is dead was kind of like my first real you know paying for studio time mm-hmm. kind of thing cool. so how long did um you like how long did you have recording for that how long did it take to record dylan is dead oh gosh you know i think it was maybe maybe just like maybe two two or three days you know mm-hmm. it might have been just like all the, all the guitar tracks vocals came in and did session um you know on the kick drum and then you know violin and bowed guitar because i wanted to try to be fucking jimmy page on that <laughs> one that one track but yeah i think three days it was pretty cut and dry but um you know it's, i'm not sure what to expect with this one man it will be a little bit more of an undertaking for sure yeah sick man well i can't wait to hear i'll let you go because we're past the hour and stuff i want you to carry on with the rest of your uh, afternoon and stuff but thank you so much for sitting down and talking to me man this has been an absolute pleasure and it's been amazing to virtually meet you and i look forward to hopefully meeting you face to face at some point i hope so as well mike thanks so much brother you're the man no thanks so much and i'll definitely have you back on once your new album's out and we can shoot this shit again all right brad i'll see you cheers cool and that is episode 20 of into the van into the bag i really hope you enjoyed this go check out dylan is dead by harry padigo Come message me and get a free digital download of The Next Life. Just hit me up on any of my social medias or email me at mike333west at outlook.com. I really hope you enjoyed this podcast and go check out uh, Harry's music. He's phenomenal. I can't wait to see what he does in the future. Obviously, we're 20 episodes in, so go check out Bella White. Go check out Ben Kaplan, Sean James, Crapsons, Plot Hounds. You know, I'm so proud of this podcast. I can't thank you all enough for listening. So until next time, guys, stay safe. Peace.